Okay, well, um, welcome everyone. Today's presentation is part of the Culture Builds Communities webinar series. This community-based project is designed to help Native communities plan and develop cultural facilities. Culture Builds Communities is a project of the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Major funding is provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the National Museum of the American Indian. Thank you so much for being here today, Ernestine. Thank you, Melissa. It is my privilege and my joy to be here with you today. Um, I, my name is Ernestine Berry, and I am the director of the, the United Two of Anne John Hare Cultural Center and Museum in uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. We have been here about 10 years, um, and I have been the director during all that time. And we have seen, uh, we started out small, as you will see when we show the video. We started out small, and as uh, Susan said, we expanded to double the size that we started out with, which we're still small, but we do have the possibility of further expansion. So that's a, that's a very good uh, element that we have planned into the uh, museum. Okay, were you ready to do the video now? I am ready. My name is Ernestine Berry. I'm director of the United Ketua Band John Hare Cultural Center and Museum in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. People call us Cherokees. We call ourselves Ketuas. Uh, Ketua is the name of the ancient people who lived in the East. Before we were uh, removed, our society was being bombarded by the Europeans. Our society changed so much. Uh, the religion ch was changing. The manner of living was changing. Everything was changing. Uh, it was just a total upheaval that was brought in by the Europeans. And then in 1870, we signed a treaty to go into the Arkansas Territory. The Arkansas Territory was just um, a good place for us to be at that time. There were no, very few white settlers there. Then by 1825, there were a number of white settlers who were pushing on us at that time. And so we decided that we needed to move farther west into Indian Territory in 1828. The Katu was then uh, reorganized the government in the 1930s and 40s under the uh, provisions of the federal government. We were able to um, then create a constitution bylaws and federal corporate charter and from there we have we became what we are today. We have um, situated here on our complex the Child Development Center the administrative building. We have the Wellness Center, we have the Elder Center, and also we have the John Hare Cultural Center and Museum. Uh, the museum is um, very important, I think, to our people and to any, I think, any Native people. Uh, it's an important place because it gives us an area where we have um, a place to keep our important documents, our important papers. A lot of our documents have gone to various places, archives, libraries, um, colleges, universities, and the reason they wound up in those places is because we had no place to keep them. The tribal uh, archive or papers were kept by the secretaries of the tribe in their, in their homes. And it's extremely important that our people know and understand their own history. The aspect of leadership in museums and language and culture is pretty much inherent in what I do as a chief. My job is to uh, introduce our tribe to the world. In doing so, uh, what better way to do that is to have artifacts and, and documents gathered in a central location where folks can come and, and review and, and read just as well as anyone else. Our job is to introduce who we are 
and where we came from and what we stand for and, 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 and ensure that our culture and identity continues from here for time, time eternal. There's federally, three federally recognized tribes today, uh, the Eastern Band, CNO, and, and of course the United Katua Band. But truly, we're looked upon as the full bloods, we're looked upon as the, the Owens. Uh, this sets us apart. What, what folks may or may not know or understand, even have a, a gumption of that, is the fact that uh, the United Katua Band, the Old Settlers, the Western Cherokees moved prior to removal. And unfortunately, we're categorized as one tribe, and, and certainly we are not. There's a display that gives a great deal of coverage about that. And so that's one of the, the great things that, uh, uh, you know, it's been archived, it's been historical, and now you can see it in play. And that's wonderful we have this opportunity. If we don't have a place like this, our history will be lost. It will, word of mouth will, is not everyday conversation about your history, uh, combined with the fact that now you have an archive all around us that, that has the actual footsteps that our leaders, previous leaders has taken, our tribe has taken. There's a couple of items that really stand out in my mind. One of them is the uh, provisional council, the ones that were in 1946, uh, and you can see their picture right over there. Uh, uh, I have a great uncle that was uh, involved with the, the council that uh, created, um, that actually did the footwork that, that made the uh, federal recognition as well as uh, 1950, the actual uh, uh, voting for our constitution and corporate charter. People can log on to our website and, and gain aspects of what goes on here, uh, but certainly this is a gathering place, a meeting place for folks to come and learn. Uh, overall, that, that, that's what it's all about, is uh, being able to uh, tell your story, tell your history. If you have the chance, come by and visit. We have a lot of things to show. Uh, visit with Ernestine, get a glimpse of uh, her knowledge and, and her abilities, and, and, and come by and see and witness. and. Uh, uh, just be a part of us for a day. You'll, you'll be surprised. When Chief Wycliffe was here, he, he proclaimed himself to be a historian. In fact, I do think he had a degree in history. And he was very much interested in history and very much interested to put Katua history out there. And uh, he was pushing for it, and the council then, uh, it's my understanding that uh, they wrote up the, the uh, resolution to create the museum, and he, he was the driver behind it, but the council approved it. The building of the museum actually began in 2009. It took them about two years to complete it from the very beginning of getting the builder and going through that whole process and then actually getting out here and moving dirt. And we started out very small. The first phase of the museum, which was built with the uh, history gallery, the offices, and um, the small archive and the archival workroom, but, but all the rooms were fairly small. And uh, then in 2010, we applied for another Indian Community Development Block Grant, which uh, gave us the other, the second phase of the museum, which gave us the temporary gallery. We extended our um, archive into um, where we could expand for our anthropological objects, which are objects that are collected, and not, not papers, but actual like 3D objects. So we were able to build that on, and uh, we added on the library and the hallway gallery. We added the all-purpose room, and uh, we added some restrooms. And so we, we just about doubled the size that we had, and I think now our, our uh, square footage is close to 18,000, 19,000 square feet. The walls are timber. They were recommending maybe uh, to use metal. It makes it a little bit easier, I think, as far as 
as uh, putting things on the wall, fixing things to the walls. And uh, the flooring was concrete, polished concrete, which is very serviceable surface for a museum. Um, it takes a lot of buffing to keep it shiny and looking good, but it's very, um, it wears well. The parking lot that we had originally was shared with the administrative building, which is the back of the museum, and the construction was able to um, acquire um, some funding for our parking lot. So now we have a parking lot in the front that is totally designated for for the museum so that people when they come they can enter through the front doors instead of coming through the north door which is a side door. So uh, and when they enter through the side door then there's the maze of the office area that they would have to come through to get to the uh, display area of the museum. So we're glad that we have that uh, parking lot that's been completely last year. Anybody who is building a museum who have lim limited funds, they may want to start out small as we did and then as you go along plan for the next phase of it. You want, I think we need to be careful uh, who we select for the architect and for the builder. Uh, our architect, which was Chief Boyd, he was he was a good architect. I liked him, and he asked me, you know, what what I thought that we needed here, and I told him the different areas that I thought would be helpful, and he uh, he drew out the plan and uh, brought it down, and I, I looked at it and changed up a, a few things that he had put on there, and he was very, very accommodative to the changes that were made, and he was very easy to work with. Now, the builder wasn't so much. He had one person here who uh, kind of was the overseer, I guess, or supervisor of the um, subcontractors he had and that some of the subcontractors were not good. And so you have to be, I would want to have some answers about who are your subcontractors. How much experience have they had working with museums in your specific areas, such as the floor, the type of floor that you have, who, who's gonna subcontract, what kind of um, experience do they have, do they have references. You know, make sure that you get some, that they have some good sub subcontractors who have worked with museums and understand the poo peculiarities of museums so that they can do a good job for you. Our museum is called the John Hare Cultural Center and Museum and uh, it is named after one of our former chiefs and our, who is still living by the way. He's 87 or 88 years old. I think he'll be 88 in April. Um, but he is still living. He's not in good health, but he is he was one of the most progressive chiefs, I think, that we had because he was willing to push the envelope. Uh, uh, several of our chiefs were rather, you know, withdrawn and reticent and and they wouldn't get out there and really work with the white world and work in the white world and and so they weren't as effective probably as they could have been but John was not bashful about working with the white world and working in the white world and participating you know in the things that that were out there and uh, he he took some chances he was willing to take some chances, and uh, he, he was willing to take a chance on getting our first bingo hall started. And by the way, it was the first one Indian bingo hall in Oklahoma. It, it came about before the Indian gaming regulations and uh, helped us with going to Washington. He, he worked at American Airlines. He was in the avionics department of American Airlines. He made good money, and uh, he also got to fly around for almost nothing and so he was able to go and he was willing to go to Washington to approach the people there in Washington with the needs that the band had and he was somewhat successful in that area and also uh, he was also a very giving kind-hearted person that's why we named this place after him and uh, he 
He still supports us very much. He tries to keep uh, encouraging people. He tries to keep himself informed about what the tribe is doing. He's very much interested still in, in what's happening here. So I think, you know, our, our museum is, is, has a, a wonderful person, has an example for all the Katuas to follow. So I think it was well named. When you enter the museum, you, you'll come to the gift shop, and most usually museums have people enter through the gift shops, so hoping that someone will see something that they'll want to buy. And of course, that helps support the museum, too. Uh, in our gift shop, of course, we, we buy from our people, we sell it, and then we use that money to buy from them again. So it would be good to have uh, more space in the gift shop. It's a very small gift shop. and. Actually, we would like to have a snack bar. A lot of museums nowadays have snack bars, and I think that would be a good addition to our um, museum, would be for snacks and, um, you know, it would give employment to another people, another person or two, and uh, be available there for people to have lunch here. Uh, out in the front, we also have a camera and we have an intercom so that if there's nobody in the gift shop at the moment while well, the person comes up, they don't have a card, they can push a button and it will activate my um, screen back in my office so that I can see who they are and uh, even talk to them. Uh, I think for our purposes right now, this is probably the best system that we can have for our security. Next we have the temporary gallery where we have temporary exhibits and that can be for a year, two years. And now at this time we have the missing pieces which is an exhibit that we went to various places and got the uh, syllabary documents to uh, translate into English. M many of our people do not read the syllabary nowadays. In fact, there probably are very few that still read the syllabary. And so in order for our people to know more of their history and to understand more of their history, they can read it in English. And also, it might be a good thing to, to have these documents in order to teach the syllabary at some time. And then we're planning now to have a, an exhibit here in the Temporary Gallery on the Civil War and the part that the Katu was played in the Civil War, which was as Union soldiers and not as Confederate soldiers like the Cherokee Nation. We have in here uh, display cases that hold our exhibits. They have locks on them so that they cannot be removed without uh, a wrench which makes it very nice because you never know who's going to come in and what they'll do, but it makes it gives you some security for your documents or for your exhibits that you have inside. The walls, I would like to have some display cases in the walls. We have papers up on the wall now that are syllabary papers that have been enlarged so that they can be read from a distance, but I really would like to have those encased on the walls, and that is one thing that I think we really need. Um, also, the lighting in here is is very good. I like the lighting. Uh, we have LED lighting, and it's track lighting so that we can move it. The, the lights swivel so that you can turn the lights from one position to another and move them a certain distance. So they're, they're very good, and the LED lighting is something that you want to have in your um, in your exhibit area because it doesn't emit UV rays. UV rays will fade uh, any kind of paper. It also will cause the paper to become brittle and uh, disintegrate over time. And then through the door, you go to the history gallery, which we have several exhibits there that lead you through from the beginning of what we know as the beginning of the Katuas. And so we have a history that begins there and it goes through the early government to the Civil War, to the traditional people rebuilding their homes and their lives after they fought on the Union side of the Civil War, to the allotment period when we lost our land. And uh, then we go into the reorganization period in various periods of our time. Also, in the permanent gallery, we have a, a space where we have all of our chiefs up, 
and uh, tells a little bit about what happened during their particular administration, those that we could find information on. Some of the early ones, we could not find very much on them, but uh, the, the ones that we do have, we have um, information up on them. Uh, the permanent gallery is uh, one that is built to sort of express our traditional ways in that it is a seven-sided room. Uh, very unusual, I think, to have a seven-sided room, but seven is one of our sacred numbers, and so it was determined that, that our uh, history gallery should be a seven-sided uh, room. And we have the clan mask up on each column of the the uh, room so that when you come into the room it is set up like it would be at the stomp ground with uh, the um, wolf clan being the first clan on the right and then as you go around it follows the same order as the order of the clans at the stomp ground. Now a lot of times you don't want to put your exhibits in a corner so the space that's in the corner is pretty much lost to you. But in the seven sided um, room there, there are actually, I mean there are corners, there are, there are angles of course but there are no 90 degree angles and the 90 degree angle is where you lose the space. But with, with the room the way it is, with the seven sides, it gives you more efficient display space. And, and some of our tribes, that, um, that circle is, is sacred. You know, and they might want to put in a circular room for their exhibits. Uh, in the in the middle of the room, we have a skylight. It looks to be maybe six to eight feet that it protrudes up through the the roof of the room, and uh, it lights up. You turn it on at night. It's supposed to come on at night, and it's kind of an orangey, flickering kind of light that. Um, emulates a, a flickering fire or a, a stomp ground fire, and that's what it was supposed to represent. The multi-purpose room, which is across the hallway from, from the temporary exhibit, uh, serves as an area where uh, community people can meet. We've had community meetings in there. In fact, this time we're having meetings uh, once a month for um, the tradition keepers, Katua tradition keepers, who are people who have been recognized by the tribe as having uh, certain skills, arts, crafts. Uh, we have had storytellers come in and uh, they have set up in there on the stage. We uh, created a stage in there for that, for the purpose of having an area where we could have small gathering of people for storytelling or for even for people who are young people who might want to write historical sketches, they could perform those there on that stage. And so it's a, a room that would be of service to our people and to the public if they want to come in and use those, that space. It has some cabinetry there where we store our arts and crafts supplies that we use when we have uh, traditional arts and crafts classes. And uh, uh, we have a sink there which is there for the purpose of um, washing paint for having water there available for soaking of, of uh, basketry materials and things like that. So it, it, it works very well. We've done a lot of um, teaching of crafts classes, especially basketry that we have used that room for. To have it maybe twice as big as what it is, is what I would like. Uh, next to the temporary gallery is the uh, anthropological storage area. We have a bit of pottery and we have other kinds of things such as baskets and so forth from our people. And then next to that is the, um, the archive area where we keep papers that, uh, and books photographs. We have some uh, fireproof files in there. We have a map file, which is a big flat file that we use for maps and Uh, big drawings. We have some big drawings and some uh, oversized photographs that are in that file. The archival uh, storage area, anthropological storage area, along with the workroom, that needs to be in an interior space. And when we uh, had just the old uh, first phase completed, uh, that area had 
an outside wall, one outside wall, which is not not recommended. So when we built on, we built on that wall so that the area is now totally enclosed in an enclosed area, not, it has no outside walls. And that's what's recommended for museums that you have your storage area, if possible, to be in an interior area, not containing an outside wall. We would like to have an integrated system for temperature and humidity, which we don't have right now. In the archive, we have uh, standalone uh, items. If we can t uh, get some funding for that some way or other, that's what I would like to do, have an integrated system put in for the whole museum, the whole building, including office spaces and everything, where we'll have humidity control and temperature control, which are very important for, especially for the archive and for exhibit areas. So, and, and we do the best we can with freestanding uh, dehumidifiers and humidifiers, but they're, it's really not the best system. We do have a library, which at this time is really not complete. We're working to complete it. What it will be, hopefully, when we get it completed is a digital library for the purpose of research for on Katua history. So I wanted to have a place where people could come and avail themselves of that history and gain knowledge of the history and uh, have a place that would be um, where they could come and feel comfortable and have uh, someone there to help them finding the items that they are interested in and uh, is an L-shaped room and that was brought about by necessity especially because we had to have um, a ladies room and a men's room there and, and it kind of takes out some space there. Um, the L shape though can accommodate the library and it'll be just fine um, because we have the computers back in the L shape which is, is good and then we will have books and so forth and, and we have the study corrals out uh, where you can see them from the door and then the librarian will have a space right there by the door so that we can make sure that security is, is okay for, for people who are in the uh, library that uh, our documents and our books and our papers will be secure. Then we have the office area office area where my office is and then we have an office for the assistant director we have also an area which is a staging area where we can prepare our exhibits. We do have a small kitchen, which we call our cultural cuisine area. And uh, we do prepare at times cultural food. We have taken cultural foods out to some of the schools in the area. They have uh, Native American days at some of the schools and we have been privileged to participate in some of those and taking different things that, you know, of our culture that we've taken out to the schools and we've prepared them there in our kitchen. You know, I would like to see a larger kitchen and I would like to have an area where we could serve food and uh, have our cultural cuisine available for uh, groups when they come in. I think that for the Cherokees and those of us who uh, our ancestors ended up over here, either by, you know, as early settlers or uh, through the Trail of Tears or even later on, I think it's important for us, the more we know about our history, I think the more we learn about who we are and how that shapes not only our present generation through the past, but also for future generations. And I think this museum is significant in helping tell that story. I have been teaching for several years now a Native leadership class at NSU. All the time the students, regardless of which cohort goes through, they often remark about how much they learn. One of them had made the comment, even the way the museum set up, it's not that large. In the in the uh, in the display area, but the way that it's set up in a circular way, it's it's uh, presented in a way that you can get a whole lot of information in a short amount of space. And so I think just even the architecture of the museum it provides them a deeper knowledge and understanding of uh, of two different branches of Cherokee people that coexist here in Tahlequah. 
um, through the years, American Indian and Alaska Native people, and even still currently today, the, uh, the stories are continuing to be told by outsiders who maybe only see this through their own lens. I think if it wasn't here that people would um, be engulfed in hearing one side of a story um, of Cherokee people who have settled west. And I think that there would be um, things that were missed, especially regarding the spirituality and the, and the deep traditions of, of Katua people. Um, as, a, as a scholar and a um, woman who identifies with Native American and Indigenous community myself, I'm, I'm a citizen of Navajo Nation, Dene, and it's been very important for me, um, and this is what I continue to share with my students, is to connect with the histories of Native American and Indigenous peoples wherever you are. That's uh, the air we breathe, the spaces we navigate, the places where we are. Community-based sources are the most important in Native American and Indigenous studies because for so long we have non-Natives, especially those from the white settler colonizer state who serve as agents of those colonizing power dynamics and they're distorting and misrepresenting or just outrightly ignoring and erasing histories of Native American and indigenous peoples. And it's really um, the knowledge keepers like director Ernestine Berry and the community um, who preserve and sustain, continue the knowledge and histories of their people. So when you're walking through, it's like you're finally walking through the history lessons that you should have had. It's not just, and this is a part of decolonizing museums, is that it's not just here are Indians frozen in a box, like in natural history museums, like they're some kind of animal that's going extinct, so the last of whatever, you know, and, and it's, that's the issue with the stereotypes is they freeze Indians in time and they say these are these are the last of the Indians and there's no more. When you come here, you see these are living, breathing communities and peoples. And yes, it, it, it's history over time, even traced back to time immemorial, but indigenous communities are still here. They're alive, they're carrying these stories, not frozen and dynamic peoples who have much to contribute and history still in the making. You know, the story's not over. I really think that a museum, an archive is extremely important for any tribe because of, of the number of papers that have been lost by various tribes because they had no place to keep them. And that's exactly the way we were. We had no place to keep our papers and we lost volumes of papers, historical documents, original historical documents, because we had no place to keep them. And it's, it's very advisable for every tribe to have their own museum so they can keep their own papers and their own history and have control of it themselves and not have to go like we did to various places to round up our documents. That you can keep them housed within your own facility and keep them, you know, you're, the tribe itself is, is the entity that is most concerned about those papers and willing to keep those papers um, in good shape and available to tribal members and others who are interested in, in the history of the tribes. And so it's very important for us all to have our own museum. In spite of the few problems and, and uh, um, difficulties that we have here in the museum that are not unmanageable, um, we, we are so grateful, so thankful, and we love our museum, and we believe that our people appreciate it so much. Well, thank you very much for that, Ernestine. That was a fantastic video. Um, what else would you like to share with us? Uh, well, um, I'd like to say that it has been a real privilege and honor for me to serve my people in this, in this uh, position. Um, 
I have for so many years wanted our people to have such a place because of the lack of um, facilities that can hold our documents and knowing the, some of the former secretaries who were charged with keeping those documents and how those documents became lost. So uh, it has been just really a privilege and honor to be here to represent my people and to be able to uh, dig into the histories and to reveal the history of the tribe and to try to better inform our own people, first of all, and then uh, people in the area and by the out. So that has been just really a great experience. And I, I wonder if there's anybody that would uh, have a question. Yeah, so what questions do we have for Ernestine? Um, Ernestine, this is Daniel Glenn. I'm an architect working with the Crow and the Squally tribes, uh, my own tribes, the Crow. We have a few of us here. I really appreciate your discussion and overview of your museum. Um, I wonder, it sound, I'm curious, what, from your perspective, uh, when it's called a museum and cultural center, what, what, how do you distinguish those two aspects and, and how does it function as a cultural center versus a museum or is it kind of the same thing in your mind? Well, I think the museum is, is the place where we, you know, we keep and we share our history. We're a history museum. And uh, the cultural center, we try to share the culture with our own people and with people in the area. Um, we have had crafts classes, cultural crafts classes, and we invite everybody, not just tribal people, but we put those, announce those in the newspaper and on the radio, and we try to gather in other people from uh, our friends and our neighbors, whoever, they could be Indian, not Indian, whatever, come in and learn about our culture through basketry and through um, jewelry making. We have those classes. We have just various classes on, on our culture that uh, we, we share with, with uh, each other and with the, the modern community. And is there a specific part of the building that you would say physically is more for that function versus the museum function? Is it subdivided somehow uh, into those different? We have our, we call it an all-purpose room, and that's actually the place where we do our teaching for our, our cultural classes. Um, we would like, of course, to expand, like I said, you know, where the museum is, is still rather small, and we, I would like to have another uh, expansion onto the museum, uh, particularly for our veterans. I'd like to have a veterans display and have an area for our veterans to gather. Um, I think that would be an excellent addition for our museum. Um, and what regarding your visitorship what percentage is it outsiders versus your own people as far as spending time at the museum um i would say that we get probably more outsiders than we do our own people coming in uh, we're a rather small tribe here in this area there's in, in the Tahlequah area, we're scattered over 14 counties of Oklahoma. And here in the Tahlequah area, we may have around, I think, 600, 700 people. And uh, the whole area here in Tahlequah, I think, is a population of about 25 to 27,000. And so we have, uh, we have more people. We have schools that come in. We have the university that comes in. Um, 
we have civic groups that come in and also we go out to the schools and um, share the culture in that way. And we go to Tulsa a lot of times they'll have an opening for when the school is opening and they have um, natives come there and talk about their culture and share their culture with, with Tulsa school children. We do that also. And uh, I, I do think that um, our people appreciate our museum and they do come, but we have, we don't have a lot of our people who live here in the area. A lot of our people live out in the rural communities. Um, most of our people live in rural communities. And uh, some of them do not have the kinds of transportation that most people have, especially our elders. And so it's kind of difficult for them to get in, into town. Mm -hmm. I can, if I can piggyback on that um, real fast, um, I uh, am a professor and have been in Florida for um, many years and have brought students who are diverse and from across the world. And so they uh, do an immersion experience. Every semester we have about 40 to 50, I think, students who are nurses and working on advanced degrees and uh, they work with the Katua communities. Um, but one of the highlights is coming and um, to the museum and getting the history lesson that um, is provided both visually and auditorially by Ernestine. And uh, so it has really served well. And so I think it's safe to say that uh, the museum has had a, a global uh, attention and global attraction. And so we really have appreciated having that available. And, and then the classrooms that are there and have served well too, to be able to have um, sessions with different uh, focuses and uh, some with Ernestine, some with other tribal leaders. And so thank you. And uh, it's just been a real Real joy and blessing to us to have the museum. Thank you, Ernestine. Thank you, John. Uh, we appreciate John uh, bringing his nursing classes here from Florida. For several years, he's done that for about three times a year. They would come here to the United School Band, and uh, they would always he would always bring them here to the museum. So every class that he has, uh, I think they're the, the upper class. Uh, that are graduating or have graduated just recently, he brings them into the museum and they we share with them the history of the United School Band. They're always very appreciative and always so enjoyable to have them here. And also Susan Fellow brought in class from OHU one time that we really just enjoyed it so much. And, and I always enjoy having college classes in here. We have a number of classes that come in on a regular basis from the universities and colleges and uh, we always enjoy them so much and they they seem like they enjoy the, the uh, museum very much too they did. We worked with the architectural, uh, fourth year architectural students at OSU and they designed um, some um, footprints for a museum for the Pawnee Nation and it was an interesting experience but we took them to see um, the Katua Museum, because as I said, I think it's a very great example of what a small community can do. Ernestine, um, you, that gallery hallway that you have, you use that for temporary exhibits of local artists too, is that is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, so it's not just a place to transition, it, it's actually a gallery space. And I didn't mean to interrupt you, I apologize. It is designed for a uh, a uh, display of, of artworks. It has a, a rail at the top and the lighting there on the side is especially for display of artworks. So we're glad to have that. And uh, we haven't actually had um, an art show as such, which we were planning to have one this coming year. Uh, we don't know how that's going to turn out because of the COVID and so, but uh, as soon as we're through this pandemic, we hope that we can have uh, show of our local artists, of our, especially of our tribal artists. And we do have a number of tribal artists who are very good, so we like to show them off. It, it's just everything about this museum is practical. 
And I, I think that's one reason I have such admiration for it. And I also wanted to acknowledge Chief Bunch and, and thank you for all of your support of culture and you're just an ideal tribal leader. And so thank you for all of that. Um, and Ernestine has always been really good about sharing lessons learned. And one of the lessons that she shared with me is to always try to have your uh, HVAC zoned because what's good for your archives isn't necessarily good for your staff. So would you like to address that, Ernestine? Sorry, Susan, if I understand all you were saying. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll get a little bit closer to my computer. I was talking about how you shared with me that it's important to have your HVAC zoned so that you you can control temperatures in different areas because what's good for your archive isn't necessarily good for your staff people. Yes, that's right. Uh, <clears throat> and that was one thing I should have addressed that I didn't think of at the time. Thank you for mentioning that, Susan. Um, we have our, our archive and our anthropological are on the same cooling heating system as part of the office area. And so uh, through experience, we have learned that that is not the best way to go. Uh, you should uh, try to separate your, your storage areas and your display areas from your office areas so that you can control the heat and the cooling separately from each other so that uh, the workers are comfortable and also you can keep your storage areas at the proper temperature and humidity. So we had one little girl working back in the office and uh, she kept turning the, uh, at the heat as it was an air conditioning, she kept turning it up where it would be warmer in there. And I kept saying, no, you can't do that. You need to get you a sweater, jacket, or something and wear it because we have this system that it goes both into the archive and to this office. So she began to wear her, her jacket during the work period, even, you know, in the summertime. So that's what I do, too. I ordinarily keep a sweater or a jacket here so that I can adjust myself instead of having to adjust the the air conditioner. That's a good point. So do you have plans for future expansion? Well, I have some plans <laughs> in my head at the moment. Uh, we haven't actually started working on anything yet, but I, I have been thinking about, I, we have a lot of veterans and uh, sometimes they kind of get left out, you know, and so I, I'm thinking that we would have a special, in addition to some other things, such as I mentioned, you know, about maybe enlarging the kitchen and having a way to have, to have snacks and have a, a bigger uh, craft area. In that same uh, area, we would have a special place to display for our veterans. So that's what, that's kind of what is going in my mind right now. Great. And it sounds like a, another one of your lessons learned is to always build spaces larger than what you think you're going to need. So that's, uh, I've heard you say that many times that you don't have enough space. Yeah. And I did ask the architect last time when he was designing the, the uh, second place, let him be sure to um, design it so that it's an easy build on the third, the third edition. So he did that. So it'll be easier for us to build on. Great. Um, Melissa, yeah. so I'll turn it back to you. Perfect. Um, so what other questions do we have for Ernestine? Shanann Sigu, Ernestine, this is Jessica Winstaffer with Chickaloo Native Village in Alaska. Um, super inspirational video and discussion afterward. Thank you so much, Shanann, for uh, sharing that and clearly be being this very long-term visionary and guiding light to make this happen. Um, you are seemingly a one-woman show on this project, which is very incredible. Um, you mentioned in the video uh, some of the funding, and I wonder if you could kind of recap the different funding sources that you had for the project, because uh, we will inevitably have to be writing for grants, but maybe there are other funding sources 
you know, names of grants or either other ideas that, that you would have that would help us? Well, the major funding for the museum came from the Indian Development, uh, Indian Community Development Block, 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 uh, block Grant uh, for both phases. Um, that was one reason I guess that we built it in phases is because you can get the money to start and build your first phase and then apply again and get the money for the second phase. So that's, that was the major funding for both places of our museum. And in addition, at the time, the tribe had a casino and we devoted a lot of that money to the museum, especially in paying uh, salaries. And we had six people working here at one time. Um, and now we have myself, one part-time girl and two volunteers because our, our casino is no more. So um, hopefully we will, this is what we're looking forward to, is, is being able to generate more funding for our discretionary funding for our, our uh, building and for um, funding other types of things also. But the uh, community, any community development block grant is just a really a, a, excellent place. Um, we also uh, had the Army Corps of Engineers to act as inspectors uh, during the building phase, and um, they uh, are very good. You have to pay them with the, the funding that you get also, but it, I think it kind of gives you an edge when you also uh, involve them in the building phases to uh, get the get the block grants. So that's one little you know thing that, that might be helpful. Ernestine is also very good at uh, um, accessing funds from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And what other federal agencies have funded you? Uh, the um, National Endowment for the Humanities, I thought I'd forget from that. The Oklahoma Library, um, Department of Libraries, um, the Oklahoma Arts Council, That's good. That, that's a great, great start. Uh, uh, we have really enjoyed uh, getting some of the, the uh, grants that we have gotten. Um, when Susan was working with the, the library, Oklahoma Department of Libraries. We got a grant there, and that was really the one that kind of uh, kick-started us on our grant, um, um, on receiving grants and being able to put the grants in order and get them uh, to the agencies and to have them funded um, because the grant that we got from the Oklahoma Department of Libraries was, I believe, the first one we got. And uh, it was a traveling archivist. You remember that one, Susan? Mm -hmm. um, we had an archivist that came in and did an assessment of our archive and told us what we needed to uh, develop our archive, to uh, furnish our archive, and uh, so that's what we did. We, we uh, took that um, report that she wrote, and that was Rebecca Elder, we took that report and uh, used it to um, write the ILS grant, the ILS grant that we've got, we've gotten four of those so far. So, um, it was just really a uh, godsend to us that we had uh, Rebecca Elder come in and help us with that. And uh, then from there, we just kind of started you know, uh, writing grants and getting those grants because we did have a need for the money that was available. And so we were able to get that. And we're just very thankful that uh, we were able to get that Oklahoma Department uh, of Libraries grant. Having a plan really does help you leverage other funding. Um, but, and the other thing that Ernestine does that I greatly admire, uh, one of the many things, is that she also pays a lot of attention to traveling exhibits and, and any time that she can bring something into the community, um, she does. And so that keeps her 
for the museum fresh and keeps people coming back for new experiences. What was that one that you just did, that traveling one? I forgot. Uh, that one was, I think you're talking about the one from Georgia, the mm -hmm. uh, transportation in Georgia. They um, have archaeologists on staff, and when they do road building or bridge building, um, of course, it's a federal requirement that they um, stop what they're doing when they find artifacts and such. And so that's that's what they do. And then when they find those, they, they, they store them. They have a, according to them, they have a huge warehouse where they store all the artifacts and things that they have found that were uh, dug up during uh, road construction and bridge construction. And uh, they're required to keep those. And we, we were uh, privileged to be able to uh, get some of those items to bring them into our um, museum and to have a display of those. And also to have um, some other uh, art artists, the other artists from the area who, um, who did works that were similar to those of the Mississippian period. That was the period that, that uh, the Georgia Department of Transportation had. And so there are a number of artists that have done works in that same style, kind of mimicking that style. And so we brought a lot of those in and uh, displayed those. And Sharon uh, Young was um, uh, very instrumental in helping us do that. So we're, we're very glad that we had that exhibit. And we had quite a number of people from here that were very interested in that exhibit from Georgia. And I think it would be good if possibly we could have another one because they have so many artifacts there that we can actually access. And the other thing that Ernestine does is she reaches out to the community whenever she does a new exhibit and she engages the community in bringing in artifacts to uh, display what they have. Like, what is that when you're grinding the the, um, the hickory nuts? What is that called? Oh, when you're grinding, is it hickory nuts that you grind on that grinding stone that you demonstrated? Oh, that was corn. That was a corn grinder that uh, was brought in and uh, it's just a stone with another smaller stone that they used to grind the, the corn with. You put the corn on this big stone and grind it with the stone and uh, make cornmeal. Of course, that was one of the uh, uh, basic foods of, of all the peoples, I guess, of, of the Southeast was the corn. And it was a major, major thing that they had. Of course, the three was the beans, the corn, and what else? Canucci. Farina just was Fanucci. So. Well, okay. I'm going to be quiet and see if anybody else has questions. Um, it looks like we have one question in the chat. Um, Colleen asked, "Is um, after your facility opened, did it get any donations or items repatriated? If so, does this demand more space in your collections area? Well, we haven't had very many things repatriated. Uh, the thing of the, the reason for that is I think that this is not really our traditional home. Our home was in Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, in there. And so I think that uh, the Eastern Band, who is still located in North Carolina, they have a lot of things that have been repatriated to them because they're still located in the area where we originated. And so for us here, if there are artifacts that are uh, reclaimed, uh, they're from some other tribe, not from us. So as far as repatriation, we have gotten a few things from the East that uh, some of the archaeologists and some of the federal agencies have allowed us to, to have. But um, most of those things come and go to the Eastern Bank. Do, does that answer your question? I think that was very good. What other questions do we have? Anything else? 
All right. Well, if there are no other questions, then I just want to say thank you so much, Ernestine, for sharing your time today for a fantastic video and so much knowledge that you imparted to us. We really appreciate it. And I will make sure to post this video up on our website um, so you can share it with others. And um, I will see the rest of you next Wednesday. Thank you, Ernestine. Thank you, Chief Bunch. Thank you so much for the privilege of, of presenting our, our museum. It was a wonderful, wonderful privilege and an honor, Susan and Melissa. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was Thank wonderful you. seeing you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.